It's meetings. Uh, I was about to ask. Yeah, we should be recording this because it's going to be epic. Yeah. So as Tony said, I'm Bryce. Uh, my uh, current claim to fame is that I uh, chair the C++ Library Evolution Group, which uh, is responsible for putting the things into the standard library. Um, and I work at NVIDIA where I work on uh, HPC compilers, C++ libraries, a bunch of other cool stuff relating to programming languages and high performance computing, parallel programming. Um, I get to work with a lot of really cool people. Um, yeah. All right, next is uh, Guy Davidson. In Canada, we say Guy, Guy Davidson. Actually, it doesn't doesn't really fit in French, but Guy, Guy, Guy Davidson, maybe um, we had to uh, pound include guy. Uh, he will give, be giving us lots of pointers, I'm sure. I hope things don't get too graphic. I expect a more linear, almost algebraic approach from Guy. Thank you, Tom. That was, uh, that was quite thorough. Hello, my name's Guy Davidson. I'm the head of engineering practice at Creative Assembly. Uh, I've been working there since 1999, but I joined there with 30 people, and it was a small indie developer in the south of England. It's now, 20 years later, the oldest and largest games company in the United Kingdom with over 800 people. We make the Total War franchise. You might have heard of Warhammer. We do Total War Warhammer. Uh, you might have heard of Alien Isolation. We did that one too. These are all games that you should go out and buy within the next two or three days because that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> all right, next is Nicole Mazuka. I don't know if I said that right, sorry, Nicole. Um, has been called the cutest VC package maintainer. Um, and I completely agree. Uh, I only know Billy as the other package VC <laughs> package maintainer, but uh, who's also very cute, I'm sure. But uh, I'm going to go with Nicole on this one. Uh, Nicole is an honorary Canadian, because I just said so. Um, and she has been invited uh, to uh, sit with CORE by people from CORE. Um, by all of core actually, even though it was only one person in core, when core says something, the rest just nod and, and grunt and they, they have this like single hive mind. So, um, I don't know, Nicole. Uh, yeah. So, uh, that's a pretty good introduction. I'm an honorary BCite, uh, down, down South here. Uh, and I do say Zed. So basically See? Canadian already, yeah. uh, and I'm at Microsoft. I'm literally in Microsoft. That's the uh, room where the C++ standard library happens. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I work on VC package. Uh, and last not but not least, we have Christopher DeBella. Speaking of hive minds, Chris works at Google. Um, no oh. one mem no one mem compares to Chris. Uh, you know, because he's not equal equality comparable with, I guess. Um, Chris works on libc++, um, so I hope he doesn't string us along too much on his path to vectory. Chris? Um, I, I work on the Chrome OS toolchain team uh, at Google. Uh, oh, I'm Chris, um, in case you didn't catch that bit. Um, and yeah, I occasionally put work into libc++, mostly on ranges or trying to get better headers and diagnostics. All right, are we, are, we, are we good to go? Let's uh, let's see the first topic of the debate here. Um, let's see what I got. Okay, be it resolved that Montreal bagels are the better bagel and New York bagels are inferior. Bryce and Nicole, you will be arguing against this fact. Uh, Guy and Christopher will, will be reminding everyone that it is true. Look, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> saying that Montreal, quote, bagels aren't good. I'm just saying that they're not bagels. I mean, yeah. you don't you don't even fry them like that. That is wood, a fundamental part wood, of the wood fire oven. Process. Sorry, you know what? Sorry, did you say fry bagels? I, I, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, I'm also curious bagels. on that one. That that is not how you make bagels. You boil them, and then you put them in the oven. It's, it's boiled. Boil. You boil like, dough. You yes. put it in a circle, and then you boil it. That is the point. Well, it, it, it boils. It, what boil dough. It's, it's, no, you it's, wood fire oven. You put them in a wood fire oven. That is the correct way to make bagels. No, that's Sorry. That is the correct way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the chair should not be weighing in on this, but 
Thank you. That is the correct way. You know, you know what? Oh, I, 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 I've been told by my producers that uh, this is actually an unfair debate because it's so obvious that Montreal bagels are the best and that we should pick a different topic. I'm sure that they're very good, like dough donuts, but they're not bagels. All right. I, I got a new topic. Uh, uh, the topic is the, stan the standard C library. What should and should not be in it? Um, Graphics. And I will say, I will say that we do not really have a standard format here. Mostly a freestanding discussion, a range of topics, an array of questions. We'll hash things out. We'll discuss some cases. See if we can switch anyone's declarations. We hope not to get too overloaded. Try to catch everything while we iterate on this topic. And I don't want to hear any more pushback on my puns. If you've listened to the debaters before, all the puns should have been standard expected. All right. Yeah. I think we've queued everything up. Uh, let's see what's on deck. Um, on the debaters, we usually start with a uh, some kind of quick statement from one of the debaters outlining their position. And I bet Bryce wants to start. Uh, um, my, uh, my position is fairly simple. The C++ standard library should only contain things that could not possibly live anywhere else. Um, so that's only things that have a specific reason that they need to be in the standard library, not things that are just generally useful. So things that require language support, um, things that abstract uh, over um, different platform specific interfaces like file system access or IO, um, and things that uh, need to be part of the common vocabulary like uh, string view or vector that need to appear in multiple different library interfaces. And so we should have um, just a single uh, uh, version of them that uh, we all agree upon because we just want one way of spelling them. And uh, that's all that should be in the standard library and nothing else. That's, I my, will, that's my stance. I will agree and add on that there are even platform primitives that should not be in the standard library if they are liable to change. For example, SSL should not be in the standard, or TLS should not be in the standard library because we have to break TSL. TLS. TLS. Because we have to break TLS and the standard library can't break programs. Additionally, anything that is not fully vetted and tested by like, implementing it outside a standard library first, then implementing it inside a standard library, and then being standardized should not be in the standard library. I, I, I see that somebody in the chat just said, strong statement, remove all containers, yada, yada. I, I'm pretty sure that I explicitly used vector as one of my examples there as something that is part of the common vocabulary that, that appears at interfaces. And, and likewise, I consider the algorithms to just be a part of vectors interface because the alternative would be to have a superclass vector. So I'm not saying that, you know, we shouldn't have our core containers. Um, and the, 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 the TLS argument or the, the argument of, of things that change rapidly um, is, you know, that, 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 one, that one to me is an interesting one because I wonder if there is some future world in which we could find a way to ship such things as part of the standard library that uh, that do evolve uh, quicker. But today we just like the current the current user contract that we have, not a chance. Yeah, like we do not want to do URL lib style stuff in C plus plus. We do not want. Is, is are they up to URL lib three now or something like? Haven't we decided URLs yet? Aren't they kind of fixed finally? They are not. I mean, Python clearly screwed it up like twice. Yeah. Well, now we got it. Now we can do it, right? We've got the industry experience. I, I think Guy wanted to jump in here. Um, yeah, I actually do agree with Bryce. I first got to the, um, when I first joined the committee, it was to promote a graphics paper which I really loved. And I thought, yes, yes, this is what we need. We need to be able to draw things as standard. And I still believe that, but uh, I'm not quite sure how to put it in there. I'd love there to be a standard package, but you know, we've been trying to standardize packaging through SG15 for, for a while. And, and it, it, we still seem to be, whatever that is, um, 
orbiting, orbiting around the problem. Um, so it still seems to be looking for a solution. Um, and I worry that the potential existence of a, a, a we will have a packaging solution eventually, sure, certainly we will, might be putting off the inclusion of stuff that we may indeed actually need. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my take. What should we do about, um, you know, like if I'm, if I'm trying to teach C++ to a new generation of programmers, mm -hmm. they've got nothing to, I mean, they can do hello world and even that's not yeah. Unicode, they, but let's. They can, you can I, teach I, them to I, use VC package. I, I, have you used VC package, yes. Tony? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't want package. to say that well, you know, Nicole's just sitting right there. It's I, very good. <laughs> I've yeah. uh, I've got some experience with this, uh, as in like actually teaching C plus plus one hundred one with VC package. It is a really interesting experience, um, and you have to get students to understand what package management is and why it's important, and then also get them to understand build systems. Also very important, but sometimes orthogonal. Uh, but I do think that it does lead to getting them to use VC package, even if it's implicitly, even if it's just getting them to understand how manifest file works and giving them some script that that kind of banishes everything else to, uh, to I'm just going to type install pa uh, package manager, uh, then it, it, it just gets them using things that are actually uh, useful in only a matter of seconds, because there's only two things that you need to do there. One, update the package, uh, so update, update the manifest file, which gets people installing packages. And two, um, updating the CMake lists to uh, find package. And then they've, they've got their package. And things happen to work a lot more smoothly. And you can teach them a lot more richly when they have more things at their fingertips. I, I will also say on the whole Unicode thing, because I noticed someone said something about Hello World in Unicode, is it like that should be part of the standard library, I think. Like at least like getting UTF-8 to the screen and like only one compiler actually has to, you have to deal with it because it's only MSCC on Windows and like they are working on it, but it could definitely be better. Yeah, can we so, debate UTF-8? I don't that's necessarily easy think debate. it's a standard library <laughs> thing. I think it's a, the implementation needs to get better and Windows needs to get better about UTF-8 support. Yeah, unfortunately, Windows was was one of the first to do Unicode in any form. And now that forced them to be behind, actually. So yeah, I picked the wrong horse in the Unicode yeah. race. And I, I mean, I, I would certainly tend to agree that I, I in fact, I would think I, I think one of the key priorities that the standard library has over the next um, decade is uh, to add proper text facilities and to modernize our, our text story, which today is essentially just stood string. I, as a person who's not going to be responsible for implementing that, I think it's the most important priority. Yeah. yeah. The, on, the only real challenge there is that um, uh, we, we have that evolution problem that uh, Unicode um, tends to iterate on a, a faster cadence than uh, the C++ standard library. And so we have to design around that. Do we really need to, to worry about that a lot? Because once we've got the algorithms in place, what changes in, uh, in the Unicode space that we need to care about? I'm not qualified enough to describe exactly what it is, but I believe you, you need to be able to get the newer Unicode releases. Um, I guess there's, they add new emoji and other things. That sounds like I, an implementation problem, not a standard problem. It, but it, 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 it impacts the design. For example, if the way that you select a, a version of Unicode is something that, um, you know, if it's an enum, um, instead of something that is completely a dynamic lookup, um, uh, then that would require extending that enum, you know, which we can only do every uh, three years. Well, you know, it, if, it we, if, we like... if we standardized um, time zones, like we've got time zone support. <laughs> right, you know. but, but, and, and that's, that, that's a very good example here. And I think this is, this is an example of, of ways in which we might be able to actually 
ship something, not probably not TLS, but something similar to TLS that we know is going to require change. If we, if we say from the start of the design process, this is a library facility that we need to design in such a way that uh, it can be resilient to future change. Um, it can be resilient to the fact that, that there may be updates from some other standard or from you know, security updates, et cetera. Um, and, and if we keep that in mind as we're designing the library, um, uh, it's possible that we can build library facilities that um, uh, like in areas that are you know, known to change regularly. Well, especially when if it changes, like the fundamental point of the library doesn't change. It's just details that change, and right, you can not necessarily abstract that away, but you can, like the interfaces don't change, right? You know, I want. Yeah, it depends on if if something in the interface does need to change because yeah. of another standard. Well, That's in that case, you just that yeah, yeah. Then you just pick a different name and you throw the old one away. <laughs> That's how. I, it, I think, how it works. I think here, like what we should be looking at is not necessarily like the stuff that changes every Unicode standard, but like the mm. basic stuff, right? Like what, what I care about as a user is getting a Unicode string, like a UTF-8 string, and then printing it to the screen or storing it somewhere or converting between UTF-8 and UTF-16 or UTF-16 and UTF-32. And that kind of stuff doesn't change between standards versions. What we care about is that stuff. Like, I don't think that the standard library should contain Unicode classification or uh, it, I don't, you could argue differently. And I know that FUMT uh, or the STID format stuff actually does require some of this, but like figuring out how wide a character is for example, doesn't need to be in the standard library. That can be in a third party library, but we don't even have like the basics in the standard library yet, um, which is not great. Text is hard though, isn't it? I mean, text is really, really hard. You know, it's, 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 it's thousands of years old for a start. We have, you know, we've been scribbling text and making, and making notes to ourselves for, for you know, well, long longer than we've been sharing them with other people. Uh, it, it's, it seems like a mammoth undertaking trying to standardize what, you know, all human written communication in a single, uh, I appreciate the Unicode standard is you know, doing a great job of it, but it's a, it's a mammoth task. It's huge. So, you know, as a debate, you guys are all agreeing with each other. So um, <laughs> let's go back to Bryce's list of things. You said something about abstracting over OS, you know, things that, that are, you know, to make things cross-platform. So this yeah, means that's, we, that's, um, that's this means we all agree that um, we want graphics in the standard library, right? Um, I, I would say again, that I, I think, uh, I think something like graphics is, not a good candidate because it is something that changes, uh, that, that, that is still changing and evolving. Um, uh, and uh, if we standardized it today, we, it, we would have to stand, we would have to be okay with whatever that interface is being the interface that would be in use for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, because today, uh, the C++ standard does not, um, does not handle change well. It's like an, an old grumpy man. Um, it just wants things to be the way that they've always been. Um, and so because of that, I don't think that uh, 2D graphics would be a good fit. But I, I, I would argue that there's another reason, which is um, I'm not opposed, I wouldn't be opposed to us standardizing 2D graphics in the future. Um, uh, but I think that there's a lot of other things, some of which are prerequisites that um, we would need to have first. Um, there's so much that's missing from the standard library today. Um, you know, text, Unicode, um, things like linear al algebra, geometry, vocabulary types. I would want to see us have those in first, um, or even just like, you know, one of the, the other big focuses for 
the next decade is um, all around asynchrony, um, both for uh, networking, for IO, um, and for parallelism. Um, I mean, we have to recognize that our, our time and resources are limited. Um, and I'm not, I don't think that 2D graphics serves enough users um, to warrant us focusing on it when we've got higher priority things right now. And also there's a lot of prerequisites that I think we have to, um, we have to land first. And, and am, again, am, it, it's still evolving. Yeah, I am forced to agree with Bryce here. Um, you know, after you're supposed experience. you're supposed to not agree. This is no fun, man. Yeah. Well. Oh, all right. No, Bryce is completely wrong there. We should have Thank graphics you. right away. We should aim for twenty three. Uh, you know, because obviously, I tell you what. The reason why I want graphics in the library is because <clears throat> when teaching, um, just the whole hassle of getting something on the screen that's not text is enormous. Um, there are many ways to do this. Standardizing in the library is one way. Uh, standardizing graphics packages in some, you know, or, or standardizing the way that we consume graphics packages is another way, which is the, you know, what, this is what I was alluding to with SG15. If we could standardize the way that we acquire libSDL or libSFML or, you know, any of them, there, there are so many graphics libraries out there. The thing is, all these graphics libraries, they do this, they, they do the same thing. They draw straight lines on the screen and text on the screen. That's it. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I want to be able to say, look, this is how you do it. You, you just do you know you, you just draw the thing sometimes you just want to throw up some you just want to throw up some charts on the screen or you just you just want to throw up some graphs on the screen without having to go to another library and then having to learn how to use that library as well um when it comes to, to teaching uh graphics i don't think that that's a, a good enough reason for it to be in the standard library yes i think graphics should be in the standard library no not in the next nine years um but I think it should be in there, but I don't think saying teachability of the language is a good driver because we do have package management, and we've 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 talked uh, we, we've just talked about how um, how package management is a uh, is an alternative to having things in the standard library. And guy, you have got a lot of light shining on you right now. Yeah, I'm um, saying my camera doesn't do auto exposure. Um, oh look, we're back again. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, uh, right, so. Uh, we, uh, we 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 have package managers, and whether or not you have to learn a standard API or another API, it, it, you're still having to, 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 to learn an API. You're still having to, as a teacher, you're still having to teach an API. It, just 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 pick one, and the one that you feel is the uh, is the simplest, and run with that. Because not everything, a lot of things in the standard library are easy to use and easy to teach. A lot of things aren't, and getting that right for graphics is going to be difficult. And if we have a simple thing in the, in say VC package, for example, we can just go and point at that, use that until the graphics APIs in other languages, which are iterating. Uh, I saw someone in the chat uh, previously talk about Java. And Java's had three iterations now, maybe four. It's been a long time since I've used Java. Um, once they find something that's stabilized, then we can go and look at, you know, how do we take something like SDL or SFML um, and use that as uh, as a back end for whatever API we want to be standardizing. I think but I don't I don't think that the goal should be to reach a point where I think the, the goal should be to eliminate the need for us to standardize something like two D graphics, and and that means that the package the C plus plus package okay. ecosystem should be sufficiently good that. Um, uh, that a de facto standard for graphics in C++ can emerge. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that, you know, you, you said, Chris, you, you, you don't think we could do it in the next nine years. That's part of the problem. Um, the, the C++ standardization process both moves too slowly and is standardizing things too rapidly. Um, well, it, it moves uh, slowly and it standardizes too rapidly because it's run by volunteers. People do things they're interested right. in. I was absolutely blindingly interested in graphics. I have been all my life. And that's why I focused on that. I'm enormously interested in linear algebra. And that's why I'm focusing on that. And I think there are probably more useful things than that, but I don't want to do that. I don't have the knowledge, the skill or the aptitude or the, or the inclination to, to touch much else at the moment. 
And I think we're, we're, and this this is something we're stuck with. We, it's very hard for us to recruit and persuade people to come along and say, hey, can you fill this little gap that we have in the standard, please? I'm not convinced that we can't do better, um, significantly better, in fact. Um, uh, and I, I think that the pandemic has demonstrated that because during the pandemic, um, the C++ committee's bandwidth, like the pandemic very substantially disrupted the C++ committee's ability to, to function. And, uh, you know, me and JF, we put together a plan for how we were going to adapt to this. And I think it's gone pretty well, but go and look at what Rust has done over the past three years and go and look at what Rust has done with, you know, uh, uh, you know, a volunteer led process. It, like in comparison, we are getting almost nothing done. It's uh, to a, it's almost it's almost to the point that the you know if if C plus plus does not learn how to improve its evolution process, um, C plus plus as a language will simply no longer remain competitive. And part of that is maturing the packaging ecosystem. I think part of that is I think you're undervaluing. Process. You're undervaluing the ISO, though. One of the reasons why C++ is valuable is because governments can stand behind the ISO and say, look, here's a legal document with weight and with heft. Um, Rust doesn't provide that. No, Rust doesn't I, give you any guarantees at all in that regard. I, I've, I've spent a lot of, I, I'm very heavily involved in both the international standards at the ISO level and the, the standards body within the US. And um, I, I do not think that ISO is the right standards organization for something like C++. Um, there's plenty of other options um, that would give us the same, um, the same gravitas that we get with ISO, but that are a much better fit for um, uh, a language like C++. Web standards went and built their own standards orgs. Um, uh, and I think that that would probably be a good fit for C++, but there's other options like um, IEEE, IEC. Um, I don't think that ISO has been a very good fit. I think it, 20, 30 years ago, it probably made sense, but I don't think that it's working well for us today. If, if it was oh, up to me, I now. would, if it was up to me, I would make a plan for this, for C++ to transition to a non-ISO model. What, what would be good oh. for Rust, do you think? Do you think Rust should uh, operate under some kind of external standardization? I think that Rust should, I think that Rust effectively does. I think Rust has a very good governance model. And I think that, I think that we've had a governance model that has served us well for a long time, but it is not keeping up to, uh, to date with the best practices. Um, it's, it's just not sufficiently modern. I think, I, I, I don't know if I agree that Rust is, so I think that Rust is under a decent governance model and all that. However, I do see a value of standardization. Like with C++, I can kind of figure out what is the behavior supposed to be from the standard. And the standard is not written as well as I probably would have liked, you know, like there are some st stuff that's really confusing uh, um, but if you look at like JavaScript, like JavaScript standard is extremely easy to read. Um, but Rust doesn't really have a standard model and it is really difficult to figure out what is undefined behavior or not just from like reading a document. Um, they have been working on this, but I don't, I think that Rust still has a ways to go. Um, but that, but that, you don't that, have that, to, you, it, what you're saying is that you think that Rust needs to have a normative specification. You can have a normative specification without being ISO. And in fact, sure. there is a normative specification um, for a, a part of C++ that was not developed as part of ISO, the Itanium C++ ABI. Um, which was just all the stakeholders got together, they wrote up a specification, and it, I believe, was incredibly successful. We could do that. I, I would agree that I, or I think that C++ probably shouldn't be part of ISO. I mean, obviously, with like the whole GitHub thing, we're kind of on the edge already. Um, 
however, I think that there, I think we should look more towards like JavaScript and their standardization model for how to do it right. Yeah. Because I, at least the results from their standardization seems to be very good, despite me not being actively involved in the JavaScript community. Yeah, I would agree with that. Someone else was trying to jump in there a few times. Who was it? Yeah, Chris. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry. No. Um, there's somebody remarked in the chat that without ISO, the language will never be approved for safety critical applications. That's not true. Um, I'm, I am more familiar with the safety certification process than I would like because I work at NVIDIA. Um, we safety certify plenty of stuff for um, safety critical applications that's not based on an ISO standard. And in fact, the ISO standard doesn't even really help that much for safety certification because you have to safety certify the compiler, the implementation of the standard too. So it, you know, I don't think that it greatly reduces the burden for um, using the language in something like automotive or aerospace. The, the fact that it has a normative specification is very important, yes. Does ADA have a, an ISO specification? Yes, yes, it does. ISO okay. IEC, oh, I just, I literally just looked it up. ISO IEC GTC 1 SC 22 WG 9. Yeah. ADA and COBOL are two of the stand, the two active language standards that uh, I have to deal with other than C++ because uh, they're the two that are directly overseen by SC22. I mean, obviously Rust is a at a different stage and it, all projects that are at a newer stage move faster, right? But I, I, I've been saying that for years. And um, while I think it's true, I think there's very clear signs that Rust is maturing, like the fact that there's now two Rust compilers. Speaking Although I don't that's the reason that why one of those Rust compilers does lifetime analysis. Yeah. So it's like the back end, the, the front end and the back end, but not the type checker, which is like the important cool part of Rust. This is also the reason why Rust hasn't needed to have a specification. Uh, uh, so it hasn't needed to have a, an, a normative standard up until now, because there's only been one implementation. And when you, when you only have one implementation, just like when you have uh, only one concrete algorithm that, that, that's serving one task, you don't need to generalize or standardize. Uh, going through the standards process makes sense when you have more implementations that could diverge, especially when the, the specification is very murky like Rust is. We, we didn't start out with the uh, by sitting down and going, okay, we're gonna we're gonna make ISO IEC um, uh, fourteen eighty eight two. No, we, we started out with uh, with C plus plus and which which has C front, and then I think it took a decade before um, before talks were happening about getting C plus plus standardized, and then another four years for that to uh, to maybe eight years before that happened. I just think I disagree with the premise there. Um, I think standardization and having multiple implementations are like, they are somewhat related, but they are not really fully related. Like before C7 or before C89, there were a bunch of different C implementations. Before C++ 98, there were a bunch of different C++ or at least three, three C++ implementations. Borland, yeah, Microsoft. Be more than three. <laughs> there, were, there, there were a lot. I mean, Beyond right, I've, in fact, I've just written a book, uh, and the first chapter of this book talks about the the proliferation of C plus plus compilers, which led to the demand and call for standardization. It was it was it was quite busy uh, up until 1989 when Bjorn said, "Ah, oh, we've got to do something about this," because yeah, we, we, the reason why he wrote DNE was to uh, design the evolution uh, was was to start to to that standardization process. And, and that became because there were so many people saying, how should this work? Well, this compiler does this, and this compiler does this. And it, you know, the, it, it, it was a, a very frothy place, you know. But also we have like ADA, which from my understanding, there's only one real like full implementation of ADA and there's still a standard for ADA. So like you can have, like it can be useful to have a standard for a language, even if there is only one implementation. But one of the reasons that yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you, 
the value of standardization changed greatly with the advent of the internet. When the ADA standard was developed, um, uh, you know, you, there was no internet for everybody to collaborate on. We didn't have the sort of GitHub development model that we have today. Um, the, the one thing that, that the standardization process gave collaborators that both in the past and today is um, we would not all be able to get together people from different companies and uh, collaborate on uh, uh, a you know uh, uh, how we were going to build all of our implementations without some sort of uh, legal protection from antitrust litigation, and that's actually the main reason that um, uh, that tech standards evolved is so that folks from Intel, Nvidia, Microsoft, you know, all these companies that are competitors in some way, shape, or form could get together and and uh, uh, collaborate. But if you, look at, if you look at the importance and value of, of these programming languages when we started standardizing them, like at, at the time, it didn't make sense to go and form, you know, a separate nonprofit consortium just to develop a C++ standard. So instead we went to ISO. But now obviously C++ is mission critical to, you know, um, many different companies. Um, and so we don't need to be a part of ISO to have the, um, the, the both legal and, and organizational infrastructure that we need. Um, and that's, that's how, you know, languages like JavaScript evolved. Um, uh, and JavaScript actually was in ISO. It, it was part of uh, ISO standards and then it departed. Um, and I think the same for POSIX. Um, there's a few other languages too. Um, yeah. There's, um, there's something, so someone said something a couple minutes ago that I kind of put on a stack and I wanted to pop back to it. Um, uh, how many implementations, like I'm fine with, there's lots of implementations of the C++ language, lots of compilers. How many implementations of the standard library should we have? They're all open source. They're all sitting there. I think that we should have at least as many as we do uh, and potentially more provided. And this is a huge conditional that they have the funding and support that they need to be competitive with what we already have. So that way we can um, introduce um, the, we, we can do more experimentation and improve things that, uh, uh, that the existing libraries cannot, uh, cannot go for improving on because they have obligations to existing users from a decade ago or so. I, um, I think what we've already started to see in the past three to four years, um, uh, the we've started to see standard libraries sharing um, uh, code and implementations of uh, major features. Um, for example, um, uh, libc++ and libstudc++ are on track to end up sharing uh, uh, a implementation layer for parallel algorithms. Um, libc++ and, and libstudc++ or libc++ and msvc? libc++ and libstudc++. They're not license compatible. Um, right, but the-, the One way, one way compatible. Yeah, the, the, the component, the standard library, uh, the parallel algorithm component is. Okay. They're, they're, both, they're both using it, uh, 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 a separately developed component. And, and, and I mean, that's a good point. And MSVC's standard library and libc++ are far more license compatible than um, uh, libstudc++ and libc++. So I suspect that we'll see more um, uh, sharing of code in the future. And in particular, um, if we do want a bigger standard library, I think it's almost inevitable that that happens, um, especially for some you know, sort of specialized things. I think another example is um, the special math functions. As 
to the best of my understanding, essentially all implementations um, uh, that have special math functions, their, their implementation is at least partially based on the booth special, boost special, special math functions um, uh, implementation, or they don't have an implementation yet, but when they do have one, they'll probably base it on the boost special math functions implementation because most special math functions are super complicated and nobody, uh, nobody really knows how to implement them. Another good example is the car conv um, uh, stuff, um, which uh, is very specialized um, and, uh, you know, standard library implementers are not uh, specialists. They're not, you know, necessarily experts on, you know, how to implement a good regex engine or, um, uh, you know, how to implement something like CarCon. Um, they're very good at, you know, deploying things at scale. They're very good at understanding the plat their platform and environment. Um, but uh, if we want to greatly expand what's in the standard library, then we probably have to see more code sharing between the standard libraries. And then code sharing we... between. Good. Sorry. Okay. I was going to say code sharing, um, code sharing between standard libraries doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we're going to converge to a single implementation, though. Uh, right. Because e each standard library that exists today has different goals. MSVC's goals are very right. different to libc++'s, and yet we do code share. M like, uh, MSVC takes way more uh, from libc++ than libc++ takes from MSVC. MSVC, to my chagrin, I really want to import all of MSVC's uh, tests, but that's just a lot of work uh, to do. Um, but code sharing is, I, I think, is a very important component of being able to satisfy the, the goals. Well, well I, again, again, this is why I say, like, it's sort it like, um, this is why I prefaced part of what I'm saying by, by saying, if we want a bigger standard library. Um, if, if the goal, is, like if we want the standard library that I started off this conversation uh, describing, you know, the, the minimally sized standard library that only has the, the things that absolutely must be there. Standard um, vector, nothing else. Yeah. I, well, I, and hey, arguably, I want my rotate. I want my rotate. Arguably out of the three sets of things that fit into that criterion that I gave, um, the things that need language support those are going to be fairly tied to the compiler. And so every standard library, in fact, every compiler is, may have a slightly different version of those. Um, the things that abstract over uh, uh, you know, platform details, those are going to be pretty different from platform to platform. Std thread in the MSVC implementation and std mutex in the MSVC implementation is going to look pretty different than the one in libc++ or libstud c++. And perhaps the better example there would be Stud mutex in libc++ looks pretty different than the std mutex in NVIDIA's C++ standard library. And that's a more interesting example because it's actually the same OS, it's just different um, use case requirements. Um, but then the third category of things, the vocabulary types, um, or the, not the vocabulary types, the vocabulary in general, types, functions, anything. Um, those are the things that there's less of a room for you know, uh, distinction in implementation. Um, you know, I'm the, certainly the expecting to implement matrix on libc++, libstd, c++, yeah. and MSVC myself, and and you know share the code out. It's something that you know it's it's an easy thing to do. And um, you know, we really do need a matrix class. Python is eating our lunch at the moment. Yeah, and in your implementation of that matrix class, it'll probably look more or less the same for those three. It's still, still valuable to have it in the standard library because again, we want to have one way to spell it across yeah. everywhere in C++, but it's not that valuable to have three different separate implementations of the same exact matrix interface. There's not a lot of room <clears throat> for um, implementation freedom or- uh, what, about, uh, what about vectorization of all the matrix? Like you can get some pretty in-depth. Yeah, well, I'm glad that's, you asked that's, that. That's, that's a good example. But that's less compiler or implementation dependent, and it's more CPU dependent, yeah. right? Like, like yeah. there are there are differences between how you call intrinsics on MSVC and how you call intrinsics on Clang or GCC, but like fundamentally, you're still like emitting the same assembler, and so what you care about is what CPU you're running on, and what specific uh, 
like vector instructions that the, the literal CPU you're running on has access to or GPU. Should we should we share tests between all the implementations? Yes. And yes, and I think we essentially more or less do. Okay. MSGC now, uses libc++ as tests anyways. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that the reverse is not um, true. I want to change that, but yeah. don't yeah. have the time. So does this, at some point, does this turn the tests into the standard? such that if someone writes a test and the test interpret the standard wrong and all implementations pass, the, pass that test because they all shared that test, do we then you know, throw out the standard and say, well, all the implementations do it this way? So um, um, Hiram's law. That's an interesting question. Um, wait, guy, how is it related to Hiram's law? I don't, so, so, so when it comes to testing the standard, um, not only does every different standard library have its own um, uh, set of tests, there's also two different vendors that, that write their own um, test suite, um, Perennial and, uh, and I think Plum Hall. Um, there's, there might be one or two other ones. Um, for our, for NVIDIA's compilers, we have at least like seven or eight different conformance test suites and only one of them's in house. Um, yeah. And I don't think that that's going to ever change. Um, and I think it's fairly important to have independent development of tests, um, even if it means that there's some overlap, because um, that's one of the ways that we um, uh, validate the standard itself. Yeah, that's, that's really yeah. what I want is that every library implementation writes their own tests independently. And then after that, they share their tests. And then they're like, oh, you thought the constructor worked that way? I thought it worked this way. You know, like- I, I think that's what we all essentially do. And I definitely- It's what we do don't. now, but I worry that, you know, if you start sharing too much, you'll just be like, eh, I'll, I'll wait and I'll let them write the tests and, you know. Standard library implementers love writing tests um, because they have to deal with tons and tons of corner cases. And so writing tests like saves them time. And, and in fact, is a large part of what being a standard library implementer is. My standard library team at NVIDIA, um, I, I would not be surprised if more than 50% of every engineer's time is spent writing tests or thinking about tests. Um, uh, and like, it's definitely, it's definitely at least 50% of, of, of the effort uh, that we spend in putting a new feature in. Um, I, can, I can back that up with my personal experience on libc++ as well. Yeah. I'd say more than 50% of my time is spent writing yeah. tests for the stuff I write. And, and even, even at that rate, like, you know, like we have like, what I consider pretty good tests for um, our stuff, but it's nowhere near as comprehensive as I'd like it to be. Like, like if 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 I had if I had infinite time, like the tests would test so many more corner cases that they don't currently test. Uh, I found that uh, this is not something that's really possible in libc++ because it uses asserts instead of a uh, a test framework. There are reasons for that. I'm yeah. not going to get into why that's the case. Um, I, I think it could be improved, but uh, that, that, that's an open question. Um, but I found that, that TDD is the best way to eliminate have I covered all the corner cases because it just it gets you uh, only implementing what your tests have. And if you haven't got a test for it, your, your code can't cover it. Yeah. Uh, because it's like, you, 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 sorry, if you don't have a test for it, your code does not need to cover it because there's no test for it. And so then when you try to use the, the interface that way, you're either going to get something that's an error case or it's going to be handled. All right. It's an well, interesting question in chat where somebody says, should there be a requirement that reference tests are included with the original proposals for library editions? I think that that would make it impossible for proposal authors. Um, I, I think that it's reasonable to, re to require people to provide like, uh, a production quality implementation and wording for their proposal. But I actually think that like the hardest part about implementing and deploying a standard library is writing the tests. Um, and just because you're able to write like a production quality implementation does not necessarily mean you're, you, 
Well, you can't you can't write production quality right. code without tests. I mean, yeah, you can. No, 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 but... you, you can write production quality code, but not necessarily production, but not necessarily code that is suitable quality for production deployment in a standard library. No, it's a very no, different the, 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 the amount of, of tests you would get from a from a proposal would be not on the same magnitude of standard library tests, but yeah. But it might it be, be useful to do like smoke tests or something. Yeah, like which, which I think most reference implementations tend to have. Yeah, right. And I, I expect the the table that they have showing me example code. I mean, that's that's tests right there. That's what I want to see. Um, we're halfway through, so it's time for trivia questions. Just gotta... In my hand, I have a standard list of trivia questions. Uh, panelists, if you can map the uh, 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 the question to an answer, uh, just press your uh, fizz buzzer and answer the questions if you can. Um, I'm, I'm giving out points for this. Uh, first question, uh, Boost is one of the most popular open, open source uh, C++ packages and a lot of it has, has become part of the standard. How did Boost get its name? All right, no one knows these things. Um, I, I actually have a link I will share with the people, but Boost got its name, um, and I, I've, I'm, I might, I might gloss over some details and stuff, but um, I actually talked to Herb and people about this. Um, they were talking about how Java has a big um, library and all these other problems, and you know, committee meetings um, happen. And then after the committee meeting, you go to the bar and discuss things. And they were talking about needing a, a better library for C++. And the original name was Booze. The Booze, because <laughs> it's because Booze is better than you know coffee and Java. That was part of the, the, the thing. And, and that's not the exact story, but there is, I'm going to put a link um, from Herb's um, blog. Right, he's got the uh, Guru of the Week. Um, very early on, he had a had a uh, thing about the booze pro programming language. So I'm just going to include that here as actual evidence that this is a real thing. And and somehow, I think Herb had written this first, and then people were talking about a library, and they said booze. Oh, we can use that same you know joke that Herb Herb made. Um, and then eventually, someone's like, you know, we can't actually call it that. So boost is the closest thing, but it really is connected to, you know, the booze programming language and library. Um, all right, uh, maybe a simpler qu question. Which C++ library is named after a Marvel superhero? Loki, come on people. Loki by uh, is Loki Alexander. Is library implementation? I, I didn't say standard no, library, did it? A C++ library. library. Just a C++ library. Just oh, okay. C++ library. I don't really think he named it after the Marvel. Um, it's Alexander Rescues, right? Loki yeah, library? Yeah, I think so. All right. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, what was the first good build system? For C++ <laughs> it doesn't for C++. exist yet. Trick doesn't question exist yet. doesn't exist. Yes, correct. I have points <laughs> for Bryce and Nicole. That is the correct answer. I have to keep track of your points here. Continue, now I've, I've totally stopped the conversation, but continue on with whatever we were talking about. Uh, you know, what do oh, I know what's going on The actual answer is auto tools. Oh, oh. all right, all right. <laughs> Does everybody remember the days before like you could just rely on us a uh, project having a, a CMake configuration and we had to deal yes, with auto tools? Yes, I have to deal with that all the time <laughs> because I have to build all of the libraries. Do you know how terrible Basil is? It is awful. Well, okay, it's a great if you totally control the entire system. Yeah, if you, if you do not Google do that, or if you're a user, if you are VC you package. <laughs> it is awful. We literally have to recycle our VMs for every build because otherwise Basil runs a server and it won't die, <laughs> and it breaks our builds. You can't. You can kill it. You can kill it. Um, I, I, when I when I first started at Google, I uh, I would I'd, I'd write some code and I'd go and compile and look at this this code is crap. And while it's compiling, 
um, I, I hit control C. It wouldn't, it wouldn't end. Like it, 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 so I hit control C again. And then I get a message that said, um, it, pressing control C for a third time will kill the server. And so I press control C for a third time. And then be, uh, then when I go to rebuild it, uh, my stuff, it would actually start rebuilding everything again because it would kill the server. Um, and that, what, that, what that ended up meaning was that I, spent a lot, I was wasting a lot of time because I was never doing an incremental build. I was always rebuilding everything because I never let the server uh, do its cleanup. I just, I just absolutely did a kill minus nine on it. So there should be a way for, uh, for the VC package to also do something similar. There probably is, but we've spent enough time trying to get Basil to do things that we like that it's it's like it's easier at this point to just kill the machines dead. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that the thing that you chose to complain about was Basil, not NVIDIA toolkit installers. Okay, <laughs> NVIDIA such... toolkit installers are bad, but we can, they're like a bad that we can deal with. It's like, like auto tools, they're a bad we can deal with. Uh, Python scripts, they're a bad we can deal with. Basil just breaks everything. <laughs> All right. On this topic, even though um, Bryce isn't of driving age or drinking age, um, let's talk about package managers. Um, maybe, Guy, uh, what is the status of, that's SG-15, right? You seem to be following that? It's SG-15. I, I follow it from, from afar, yes. I couldn't mm. tell you what the status is there. Oh. When SG-15 starts, actually, Bryce, you were sharing SG-15. Yeah, in the, I, I got, Titus All right. tricked me into sharing SG-15. Excellent. Yeah. And then you um, well, so, so package manager, standardizing a package manager was never truly a goal of um, SG-15. And I, I do think that it's sort of outside of the scope of what the standards committee can do, but I don't think that, that means that it's outside of the scope of what committee leadership can do. Um, my, my basic premise is that um, we, well, I, I think that the problem is actually kind of solving itself. Um, we're all coalescing around CMake, whether you like it or not, it's the de facto C++ build system. It has market share. Um, okay, but uh, that, that's it, a build system. Is it also yeah, a package I'm, manager I'm, I'm, or I'm what's get, the difference? I'm getting, I'm getting right. to my point. Right. And, and so, you know, in the future, we're going to continue coalescing around CMake, and and essentially every serious project will provide um, a CMake build system. Um, and we're also starting to see something like a few years ago, a bunch of different C plus plus package management stories started, uh, um, you know, popped out of popped into existence, and we're starting to see the the ecosystem coalesce around two of them, which is Conan and VC package. Um, and I do think that at some point, what the ecosystem will start coalescing around one of those two. Um, uh, and uh, once, uh, once sort of a, uh, the the community and the ecosystem starts leaning towards you know a winner there, um, then we'll be in a world where there will be more or less one de facto build system and one de facto um, uh, package management story. Um, and then that starts to look very much like a standard system. There are some things that I think that the C++ leadership and, and the committee and the, the foundation could do. Um, I would like to see um, some sort of package metadata server run by the standard C++ foundation where at the very least um, you would be able to uh, register package names which would help to uh, deal with uh, conflicts between different package uh, uh, systems um, so that at least there would be, you know, yes, maybe you'd have to deal with different package systems for different projects and whatnot, but at least we could have a, um, uh, a more or less uniform way of spelling packages. Um, but maybe it could even be more than that. Maybe it could be something that you could register package manifests in some sort of standard format. And maybe that's something that we should be looking at standardizing. Um, and, and so I, I do think that we should, uh, um, we should be looking at standardizing something here. What I think is unlikely is that we want a standard centralized C++ package manager, um, because that's just never really been how C++ has done things. Um, we don't have a single C++ implementation. 
Um, uh, so I, I would imagine that instead we would be talking about standardizing things like package manifests or, um, you know, um, providing some way of registering package names, et cetera, um, providing some, some ways of making an ecosystem where we can both have C++ specific package managers and we can coexist with, uh, system package managers. Um, I think that's that's um, what we should be focusing on in the future. So we, we basically give up on trying to describe how a package is, is, is uh, built. We just say that's CMake. And well, I mean, that, that I, no, I, 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 I wouldn't say give up. I'd say like, we've done it. We've yes. been success, folks. We've we've all done it. We've made oh, man. CMake the standard. <laughs> if, that's, if that's the level of success we're going for, wow. Yeah. It's CMake. I mean, I mean like, like we have, like whether you write your, your I, I think that there are kind of two concerns here. One of which is like, how do we build a thing? And that can be written in whatever scripting language your package manager wants to use, whether it's CMake or Python or I don't know, Bash, I, I don't know what app uses, but that's like fine. Like we have solved that problem. You as the user did not need to worry about that. And if you are writing a new piece of software, just use CMake. It'll be very easy for us to write the scripts for that. But you as a user do not need to, con to concern yourself with how your dependencies are built. What you care about is how they're in, like what the install tree looks like. And what that should be is either a cmic config dot or config dot cmic or package config file. And if you uh, release one of those two things or both preferably uh, literally every if you release a package config file every build system will be able to use you if you release a config.cmake file the two most important package the two most important modern build systems will be able to use you which is cmake and mason so like we have a standard way of like describing how a thing is how you use a thing which is package config and if you just release those files everybody is happy and you can, it's very easy to use any library that releases package config files. And I should just, on every build in my build server, I should just pull down the latest from the internet, right? No. From every package? No. A little hat, yes. Mm. No? Yes, no? I hear that sometimes yes. goes really bad. Yeah. Well, I, I, I hear, I get a lot of people that ask me, like, when is the committee going to standardize? Um, like packaging management and I, I i often like my first question to those folks is like have you tried conan or vc package and and often the answer is like no and uh, you know that's because th there's a momentum problem here it's like we haven't had it for so long and we're all you know sort of a little resistant to change um but you know the solutions that we have today they're actually pretty good um, and I think, uh, I, I think that um, mostly it's an adoption problem at this point. But people are saying, when are you going to standardize, you know, when, when you, have, have you standardized it yet? And we say, well, no, we've got code in the VC package. Doesn't that suggest that we, we as the committee aren't serving our users by, you know, there is clearly demand that we do standardize if people are asking when we will or have we yet or what's going on? I think that's Should we just bless true. one and say, okay, it's... Conan, or it's VCP, or, or you know, we, we can't we can as a standard pick pick. Uh, you know, let's just go yeah, with yeah. Microsoft, yeah, the, right? The, the, yeah, come on. The, the question is also kind of like asking the Roads and Traffic Authority, have you standardized boats yet? No, that's completely out of scope for us. The the the, 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 the specific problem with a package manager is that I think when a lot of people are asking for like a standard C++ package manager, they're asking like, can you, the C++ committee, publish an authoritative like source of packages? And I don't, like, I don't think that the C++ committee can do that. I don't think the C++ committee should do that. If the question is instead, can you, the C++ committee, <clears throat> standardize how package, like how packaging in C++ works, how like, you describe packages for C++ projects, stuff like that. That I think we can do. I don't think that, um, I don't think that a single 
central repository of packages is the right solution for the C++ ecosystem. Because we're C++, we all love our freedom. We love our freedom and our foot guns that, you know, if you turn the foot gun around, it really works quite well. I don't understand what the C++ standard, uh, standards committee would actually like standardize with regards to package metadata. Like, I guess you could have like a central repository of names or something, but like, as someone who has tried to standardize package metadata uh, for VC package, it doesn't seem like there's much for the committee to do here. Like, like, could you sort of my conclusion to explain more what you mean? Well, let, yeah. let's look at let's look at it from the point of view of I, I just wrote a library. I want everyone to use it, right? What should I do? Right, and I want you to all be use it. I want you either, I might be shipping uh, code or I might only be shipping libs. Um, and I, I, I know that you need to build, I know, I know that your build needs to, you know, call my library. Nicole answered you earlier. Yeah, I think so. But. <laughs> I, think, I think she should do it again because I think it's important. <laughs> it was a good answer. Please yeah. say it again. So what question am I actually asked? To well, I mean, the, the, the answer then you're saying, telling me is, is I write a, um, a CMake uh, config whatever file or a package config file. Oh, yeah. And, like, yeah. Like, I've, yeah I've written well, a library like, that's not how it. you, that's not how you publish it. That's how you tell the, you, once you've gotten the thing installed on the machine. Well, how, yeah, I mean, that's happens. what I'm saying. Let, let's back up a step then. I don't even have that yet, right? right? So. Right. So the way to do this is to, Build with CMake and make sure that your CMake installs, like make sure that CMake dash dash build blah dash dash install blah works and is correct. And then uh, I don't know how to submit it to Conan. Uh, but assuming you only care about VC package, because that's what I care about, uh, you write a VC package.json, which includes your name, your version, and your dependencies. Uh, and then you basically go to VC package, open a pull request, put in the VC package JSON, put in a little CMake script that basically calls like five functions, and then let us merge it at some point. Does it also list the license in, in that? Yes. Metadata? Yeah. With so, SPDX right. expressions. So, I mean, I think those could be the parts that this committee standardizes, but maybe we don't need to because, right. you know. We, we, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we'll need to because I think that, uh, I think that it's gonna be like with like, I don't think there's gonna be much value in the committee standardizing a build system because I think it's already more or less happened. And I think that'll, I think two or three, I think right now we are in the, the period just before um, C++ package management becomes like widely available and successful. So is our motto um, not as bad as the rest? Is that the C++ motto for these things? Build systems. I mean, look, look I, I know that people love to hate on CMake, but CMake wouldn't have gotten to where it was today, to where it is today, if it like, if it wasn't good. And like, you know, the, the reason that we all hate CMake is because build systems are terrible. Like they're, they're not well, the fun, cool, glorious part of your project. They're always gonna be a little bit painful. I don't I, think I, that there's- that It's there's really build. simple, right? Yeah. Like I was thinking I'd just write one. How hard can it be? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like CMake has been successful because it's a, it's a good build system. And that doesn't mean that it's a build system that you love. It means it's a build system that's like effective. I've got, I've got a co-op here that loves him. I don't, he's, he's listening right now. And, and hey, look, if you, if you ever have any CMake problems, just do what I, what I did and just go hire all the CMake wizards from Kitware. <laughs> or ask on hash include C++, that works too. Yeah. But no, seriously, having Robert Maynard working at your company is amazing. It's like, hey, Rob, I have this weird CMake problem. And it's just like, boom, solved. 
Um, can we go back to uh, how we fix the committee? Like, um, because it's kind of weird that I agree completely that it moves too fast and moves too slow, too slowly. Sorry. Um, wh what are we actually going to do about this? Um, I think it would require. I think that we need to. Um, Maybe I should ask a better question. What you know? Can we describe the problem better before we try to find a solution? Like, in what ways are we moving too fast, and what ways are we moving too slowly? Well, I think one way that we're moving too slowly is that the work that everybody thinks needs to be done uh, doesn't have anybody who wants to do it. You know, that's the real problem. I've already in the comments, I've seen someone saying, oh, there's work that needs to be done. I, I await your paper with glee and breathless anticipation. I really do. You know, if you think there's stuff to fix, I am all ears. I really am. I'm sure Bryce is even more all ears than I am, in fact. One of, one of the primary problems that we face is that it is too hard to, and not just too hard, it's too hard, too arcane and too draconian to actually contribute to the C++ evolution process. And a large chunk of that comes from baggage related to ISO. So the, the, the key things that we would need to do to improve the process would be to uh, greatly modernize and improve our infrastructure and how we evolve uh, uh, the language and make it a lot more open. And those two things would make it substantially easier for people to actually contribute, which would mean that more people would be contributing, which would mean that we'd have more. Do we need more people? Or We've got too many already. No, no, no. We, we, we have, we, we have, too many of a certain type of contribution. Um, I mean that, but that's been because we spent about a decade from C++11 to C++20 telling people that the way to be valuable on the committee was to propose a new feature. And that was the mistake. The, really the way to be valuable on the committee is to review an existing proposal or help fix a bug. I shoot down proposals. That's what I do on the committee. I think that's pretty helpful. But but one of the biggest bottlenecks today is um, our decision making process, which is um, you know had been constrained to face to face meetings, and we're slowly moving it towards you know a, a remote decision making process where we do some you know electronic polls, um, and like you know that is a big improvement. Um, but that's not where we should be. Like the, the way that we should make decisions on things should be, you know, more or less like reviews on GitHub PRs. Like it should all be completely asynchronous. Uh, the way that you get a proposal in should, you know, it should be, it should, it should look something like the governance model of any of the programming languages that have been adopted in the past 10 to 20 years. Um, you know, you need to get a certain number of people to review your, your um, requested proposal, and then there should be some sort of, you know, core team that needs to look at it and, and bless it before it goes in. But our reliance on these large collections of synchronous review periods, um, that is always going to, to bottleneck what we can do. So a, a lot of that, a lot of that can be changed within IISO, like like it's the ISO problem is somewhat orthogonal to that, right? Like even right now, our proposals, uh, you know, a, a lot of people probably don't realize our P paper proposals are P papers because they're not ISO proper proposals, right? No, um, it's our own system. So we can do a lot of this within ISO, can't we? No, because um, because ISO sets the stakeholder process, sets sets the sets who the, the, the final are. vote. The final vote has to be. If we stay in ISO, the final vote has to be the way the final vote is, like plenary and whatnot. But everything up to that point could be done differently. Um, if we had the willpower to do that, I think it could. Um, but it would really be pushing. It would really be pushing the limit um, of of what's in in scope and out of scope for ISO. Um, so I mean, I think if we were to stay in ISO, we would need to. Um, uh, we would need a more modern process, and ISO does have, you know, is making some attempts to, to modernize. 
Um, but like really, I, I really think that the way that we should be evolving standard C++ should effectively be like GitHub PRs. Um, and that is, um, you know, it's a good not, way to get, it's a good way to get poetry into the standard. I will yeah, say yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but it's also partially a, a, a culture change. We have to get the current stakeholders to be okay with um, a, a very different model. Like, like everybody who's currently a stakeholder would have to agree that we need to move to a new model. And that means that we'd have to convince, you know, folks. Well, I mean, you could just do it for library evolution. Like who's, <laughs> is someone gonna tell you no? Like, isn't that, isn't that your purview? Do you just say, oh, we, we started putting papers in GitHub and- uh, That's not know. how we, that's not how we work. We work by consensus. Yeah. So we, yeah. we have to, um, uh, yeah. We have to have everybody on board. And what about the problem? I mean, I'll tell you, my problem is that there's too much going on. I can't follow everything, right? But I, I, I think that that's, I think that that is because of the tools that we have available. I think that because the majority of the discussion happens on an actual email list and not on some sort of, you know, something like a discourse um, or, you know, a GitHub where you could watch specific issues or specific topics where you could filter and organize what you're looking at. Um, I think that's why it's overwhelming is because, um, uh, you know, you have to look on three or four different places across, you know, a variety of different infrastructure to sort of understand and keep up. I mean, I'm, I'm the chair of Library Evolution. I don't know half the stuff that's going on half the time. But that, that's, that's in part because I recognize that it's impossible for any one person to, to know that. And I fortunately have a really good team of people of other library evolution chairs who, you know, I can delegate stuff to, but not everybody has that. If I can make another uh, suggestion. Can someone pay me to just full-time follow the committee? Because I, I don't have time. That's, that's my problem. No? Yeah, I've had, I've had to completely abandon any thought of looking at um, uh, e evolution. It's it's all library for me. I can't possibly hope to. I'm having trouble keeping up with library, frankly, um, particularly, you know, well, writing a book, but also particularly just actually having a proposal in flight. I'm spending so much time on this linear algebra proposal um, that, you know, keeping an eye on everything else that's coming together is uh, it's. Yeah, and I have a day job. I'm the head of engineering practice at a large games company, and I that takes up well all of my working day. That's the point. I'm doing all of this voluntarily. It's an enormous amount of time. You know, the, the amount of traffic to to Lou, You know, if you if you want to properly digest it, it's it's two or three hours work a day. Yeah, I, I have um, right. Like linear algebra is actually one of the the, the areas I you know I do math all day at work. Mm -hmm. um, so I could, I could, I would love to spend time on that. And, and like you were talking about before, one of the things you, you've tried to tackle in the graphic stuff is uh, color, right? Like 99% yeah. of the community doesn't understand color. Like that's just the way it is. That's and cool. I've been doing color for like 30 years. Wow. I was going to say 20, 30 years. Um, right. <clears throat> and then uh, executors, right. I've written so many executor like things. And I'm just like, I don't have time to. Anyhow, I'll well, stop I'm complaining. Tackle, I'm happy to tackle color after after linear algebra because color is as hard as like Unicode. You know that, right? Like, yeah, it is, know, but, yeah. Why why avoid the hard things, really? You know. <laughs> and and you know, I just don't even admit to knowing anything about Unicode anymore. I don't want anyone to know I worked on that for you know, or you you know, Unicode like things, text processing for. Can we just cut that part out? Because I don't know anything about text processing in Unicode. Continue to not admit it. Uh, where were we? Anyone? We were talking about how to fix the committee. Did you fix it yet? Because I really, really need to. Really I mean, to I, I, I do think the uh, over the past two years, um, we've uh, we've made a decade of progress over the past two years um, uh, during the pandemic. You know, the entire C++ 23 design cycle will have been spent um, uh, remotely. Like all of the design work we did for C++ 23, we did um, uh, over telecons. 
Um, and, you know, we like, that's really changed, brought a lot of change very quickly. Um, and I'm really proud of that. But on the other hand, um, I think that it would have been great if we could have changed a lot more um, it, and, and it, because it, we needed to. It gives you a good excuse, though, to change stuff, right? Like we would not have changed what we have already if it wasn't, right. if we right. didn't have this reason to do it. Right. So maybe we can, we can build off that, right? Like, will we, will we stop doing um, online reviews, you know, if we start going back to meetings again? Um, uh, I really was hoping to not answer that question. <laughs> Um, cause you know, you're the first person who's asked, but, um, when JF and I, uh, uh, put together our plan at the start of the pandemic for remote live for remote evolution, there's nothing in that paper anywhere that says this is a short term thing. And like the first, the, after the first two months of the pandemic, um, JF and I, we had no idea how long it was going to go, but we both knew that regardless of when the pandemic ended, we didn't want remote uh, operations for the committee to stop. So I can't tell you what exactly it's gonna look like once we go back to face-to-face -face meetings. Um, but uh, I imagine that there will still be telecons. I imagine that we will continue using electronic polling for a lot of things. Um, and in fact, I would, I think it's entirely possible that, um, that Library Evolution won't take straw polls physically at face-to-face um, -face meetings. We'll just have discussion, and then at the end of the week, we'll do an electronic poll, and and uh, you know, both people who are at the meeting and people who are not at the meeting will be able to participate in the poll. That that mostly works. I think that's really good because it gives you time to not have to decide right this moment as to you know, am right. I strongly in favor of that? It gives me some extra thinking time. But we will have cases where. I would like to know on Monday that this paper is going forward because then I will, you know, write up some stuff. You know, I will fix the things for LEWG or for LWG, you know, on Tuesday so they can see it by the end of the week kind of thing and yeah. some of that stuff. But, you know, we can, can be case by case. There's a lot of stuff that, you know, uh, we're going to continue trying stuff. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're this all has been a big experiment. We're going to keep experimenting. I've got, I've got plenty of ideas. We have this library evolution super telecom coming up in October. We're going to see how that goes, which will essentially be, you know, we've had weekly telecons, um, but I think we need to try out a format where we have a longer, more concentrated period of review. And so we're going to try that out in October. And um, maybe that'll be the format that we'll use going forward. I don't know. We'll have to see how it goes. Aren't we constrained there by the speed at which library can review our papers? Nope, library no longer has a backlog. Library evolution has a backlog, but library no longer has a backlog. Um, the one good thing to come out of the pandemic. That is, that is, that is uh, don't, don't write more library, library evolution proposals right now. We, we have enough, we're good. <laughs> Thank you all. I would like to get through the current ones that we've got. Unless you're, unless you're VLA, VLA can continue to write proposals. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're allowed to favor as the chair, Bryce. Because, because VLA is a very interesting type of proposal author. VLA writes proposals that, that reduce the amount of work that they're, they're I have process, to do They're process proposals, not not, 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 not just process proposals, but he also will sometimes write a proposal that just brings clarity to an issue or just brings us closer to resolution. And that's the sort of paper that I want from people. It's like, don't, don't write proposals for new features. Write proposals about other proposals. You can always write a proposal about another proposal, like feedback on another proposal. I always want that. Like if your first committee paper, that's the best first committee paper to write is not proposing some new standard library function, but writing your position on some other proposal that somebody's written. That's how to be a really effective con contributor. I thought that I thought we were going to make that the rule that you can't write your own proposal until you've, you know, reviewed five other 
and, and written <laughs> review papers of five other proposals. For every five reviews, you get one proposal of your own. Yeah, I love it. I love it. There was um, something we didn't cover in this that I thought we were going to touch on was, um, and maybe we did touch on it a slight bit, but um, there, there has been that argument of um, things that are in the standard library. Um, some, some companies can't use anything outside the standard library. Then fix your process in the company. Yeah. <laughs> like I stop can't fix your corporate being, culture. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it's down to government legislation. This is one of the reasons why, for example, in the UK, we have situations where there are some fields where um, you can only use stuff that's, you know, stuff that's in, in ISO. You can't use Boost. You can't use package management or anything like that. You've got to write everything yourself from scratch. That's well, you know, like, okay, but like, yeah. like okay, wh which fields? Because I don't think that's actually a thing. But like, what like specific examples? Uh, one moment. The good thing about uh, write stuff yourself, you can just cut and paste boost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've got the best license. Sorry, I'll pause. One moment. Also, one thing I really want to make clear is that the standard, like, okay, maybe there are some government regulations that require you to only use the standard library, although I would be really curious what those are. But also, like, the standard library, people in the standard library are generalists. And so a lot of the things that we propose, like regex, are not going to have good implementations in the standard library, and they will blow your stack. Yeah. So maybe don't do that. Maybe we, use something else. Our, well, uh, in, well, NVIDIA's self-driving car platform was it was going to be C plus, it was going to be only C plus plus 14 because it's easier to just safety certify one standard. But until I fought a very long battle to make this happen, you weren't going to be allowed to use the C plus plus standard library. Why? Because the, it was going to be expensive to safety certify the implementation of it. Like, it, it, there's nothing special about what's in the ISO standard. The, the implementation still has to be safety certified. So if your, like, if, if, if your company is telling you, like, you can only use stuff in the standard library, you can only use something like something else, like, all it probably means is just like, that's like the stuff that we got certified and you can go and get the other stuff certified because it's all just like code. Also, NVIDIA has an infinite amount of money right now. So just <laughs> get, get things standardized, however, however you need to do it. Yes, that is right. We have an infinite amount of money. Well, because you can just build your own cards and then use them to generate. I won't even go on yeah. about Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have to say we that. have had legitimate discussions about whether whether we should use, like whether when our GPUs have idle cycles, should they be Bitcoin mining? Well, the, the real question is whether you should sell them or just use them yourself. Which one makes you more money? But let's not go there. You don't actually make a lot of money. Bitcoin. Yeah, not right now. Yeah, not right now. <laughs> I, I also really want to say, like, totally unrelated to everything we're talking about, but Bryce's background is like freaking magical. Holy cow! I am so jealous. I think he he did his his blind on purpose, didn't you, Bryce? No, Just it, it was it, it it's they're they're on a timer. Yeah, yeah, sure they are. You set the timer, knowing it would be in the middle of this conversation. His yeah, favorite you, feature. You're, you can you can come next time you're in town. You can come visit me and stay on the sofa that's not here right now. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I just get gray. Yeah. Yeah, this is my office. It's uh, it's it's not a bad view. Not a bad view. Did did you have uh, something, guy, that you found, or no? Uh, I'm just looking at some military stuff at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, the UK military is a bit is is um, quite particular about not using third party libraries. The the um, one thing I wanted to to get on to that too is that even if this is the case, um, and it's usually these 
you know, like military and, and big corporate things where they have a ton of money and um, they're actually hoping, you know, anything, if anyone says, I need this in the standard library because I can't afford, you know, because I work for the military and we, we only support things that are in the standard library or something like that, right? It's like, okay, and then you get, you know, volunteers writing code in the standard library and a couple of people who are getting paid for it. And why are they like, it doesn't seem like the money's going in the right direction. Right. And, and, and like, okay, let's take this specific example of like, you know, maybe it needs to be for like safety or for like military or something. Like, wh why is it that the standard library is allowed? Like, what, wh why is it that those things are, are, are okay? Well, it's because probably at some point, some evaluation was made, somebody was probably paid some money to do an audit and to say, yeah, like these things in this, in, in this particular, not in the standard, in any standard library, but in this particular tool chain, we're, we're, we're certifying that this tool chain is the tool chain that you can use. And you can use any of the things in this tool chain, but not any third party libraries. If well, we, and somebody had to pay money to make that happen. If we made the standard library 10 times the size that it was today, then it would be 10 times the effort to build that tool chain. And it's likely that the, the, the regulators would just say, okay, now you can't use the standard library. Like if, if, if they're telling you that you can't use like boost and we just add everything in boost to the standard library, the, the people the people on the yeah. other end of this are pretty smart. They're going to figure out what we did. Well, it, it might not be just that, though. It might not be so much of safety critical and everything. It's the fact that it is um, uh, a standard in the sense that um, there's companies who need everything to be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like every single thing has to be, to be written up as a, you know, requirement stocks and all that kind yeah. of stuff. It's like, it has to be a specification. It's not that they need security or, or safety, they need specification. Everything must be specified. So the standard offers a specification that, that might there's be- a lot of, There's a lot of implementation to find behavior and your standard oh, yeah, implementation for sure. is gonna have bugs and- I just, I just wanna know how we get the military industrial complex to send Christopher money. Like that, that seems to be the part that's missing in, in this, right? Because- I would go for that. Right, like some companies say, oh, we can only use stuff in the standard library. So please, so please put this in there for free. Doesn't seem like the <laughs> yeah. Like, like, like now the, the the argument about like you know you need your lawyers to approve using you know a third party library. Um, again, I, I think that's more a that's like if, it, if if that's becoming a burden, then you need to improve that part of uh, uh, your company. But again, if if the, if the standard library was adding things at the pace at which you would want access to them um, uh, and, you know, it was like, th then they would become these, these big open source code bases. And I'm pretty sure at some point your legal team would like figure it out. Like, like, like if your only argument here is like, well, we have a pre-existing approval from our legal team for everything in stood and we just want to reuse that. That's not a, that's not a motivation for standardization. Mm. And like, I'm like, I, I, I say that as somebody who spends way more of my time dealing with legal approvals for open source than I'd like. Um, yeah, and I think some of, some of the answer to that is pick one of the licenses, right? If if I look at a library and it's got the boost license in it, my legal team has already said the boost license is okay. Now maybe they might want to look at this library to to verify that it actually the person who said they wrote it actually wrote it. But you know, in terms of figuring out is this license okay, that's already been decided, right? It's like we have a list of licenses that we're allowed and a list of licenses we're not allowed, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I can confirm that we at Microsoft have that exact list. <laughs> like the, the reason I'm allowed to use FMT and catch two in VC package. Uh, not that FMT is currently in VC package, but I'm working on something. But it's because it's like a permissively licensed thing and it's fine. I have another question. Since yeah. we're talking about what should be in the standard library, um, what should we take out? Regex. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, red jacks. This is a trick question. The random, uh, the random, not the random number generators, but like the things the that take ones? random number generators and return uh, integers and floats in a certain range. Um, not because they should not be in the standard library, but because the one that are in are not standardized, like the algorithm to get from bits to type is not standardized. And that is so bad. That should be taken out and we should fix it and put a new thing in that actually is standardized. Locale in IO streams. Um, IO streams is in particular an interesting one because IO streams is the only part of the standard library that has um, uh, things with global with global dynamic C tours. Um, so like what one like it's a pile of like it's a pile of bad in many ways, but it's also a pile of bad in that um, uh, you know it has this cost that you may end up paying for when you don't actually need. Um, but yeah, locale, locale would be a good thing for us to make go away. Stood async, yeah, don't want it. Has Valerie been taken out yet? I don't, I don't Valerie's think so. Still... Yeah, Valerie no is one, pretty rough. Valerie, just no one uses it, that's all. We, we could deprecate it though. Generally the rule in the standard library is we don't deprecate and remove until we have a replacement and we're gonna have MD span and C++23. So we could, we could deprecate and take out Valerie. Is, is this an official statement from the chair of uh, LEWG that we're going to... Out of, gonna, out of all of the major things that we're trying to move into C++23 between now and December, the thing that I'm most confident will happen is MD span. And is that with a comma operator on the uh, square bracket? No. no. I mean, MD span as written today. Come on. We already deprecated you know, <laughs> we open the door for that. Standardization is an incremental process. Nothing's ever complete in the standard that we ship. So, as evidenced by the fact that C plus plus twenty three is primarily fix all the things that were broken in ranges, and we did oh, a really good initializer job. list. Oh yeah, initializer list. Uh, uh, well, how about I was... just, can, can we can we take stuff out of the language too? Yeah. Uniform initialization just. Delete it. I, I, I tell honestly you that, think uniform initialization is fine if you don't have initializer list. Yeah, yeah that, that, it's it's the cross between the two. Um, I showed up on the committee right when eleven was was going out the door, and um, I I looked at standard initializer list and and all that stuff that was going on, and something didn't feel right to me. And I was like, why don't we have uh, a built-in language tuple like thing. And it's not always a, it, like it, it is different than a, than a tuple um, because the, the initializer list size is kind of not runtime, but it's, it, you know, same initializer list can have different size, um, but, but something that's built into the language that's kind of tuple kind of initializer list. And then we could have made uh, uniform construction work on top of that. And I showed up at the committee and I, I mentioned this to like uh, Dave Abrahams, right? And it's one of the few people I knew. You should, I mean, showing up at the committee when you don't hardly know anyone is quite the experience. Um, but <laughs> I also watched, uh, uh, you know, to not tell people too much about the committee, but I watched Dave and, and Bjarna get in an argument and Dave walk out of the room. And then like 20 minutes later, Dave was like, oh yeah, let's write up a paper, you and me with uh, initializer list, fixing all this stuff. And I was like, uh, Dave, I don't know. <laughs> don't know if I want to write any papers with you, man. <laughs> he's great. I love Dave. He's, he's, he's awesome. But at the time I was like, what's going on in this committee? And uh, um, oh, sneak, sneak one preview more thing for I want to remove. listeners <coughs> will be on a future episode. Ah, nice. One more thing I want to remove is std hash. Yeah. I know it's mm -hmm. impossible to remove it, but it is a terrible, terrible interface for hashing. Yeah. Howard was trying to fix it, right? Yeah, I, types don't I, I know might, hash. I think probably std tuple and std variant I'd like to see removed um, yeah. and replaced with hash. I want yeah. type tuple and variant. And, and yeah. I, I'm usually a big fan of what I call um, uh, struct abstractions. So like, I like things that just behave like, you know, regular C++ structs or regular C++ classes. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the counterpoint here is like C arrays, like you can't return them from a function and like they decay to pointers and they do a bunch of other weird things. Um, so if we had language tuples that had a bunch of weird caveats, I wouldn't want that. But if we had language tuples that 
you know, more or less worked like, you know, classes, but just without the horror that is a stood tuple implementation. Maybe without different. allocators? Um, uh, no allocator support in the language tuple? Well, I will see, I'm actually of the, I, I'm, I, I, I take the Lukosian uh, viewpoint here. I think allocators should probably be part of the language. What other resources um, are like allocators that are uh, global resource used by everything? Uh, IO, like stood in and stood out. Maybe. I, I'm going to say the CPU, right? That's it, it, like, I don't know if people ever think of the, the um, allocators and executors share the same problem, right? It's a global resource that you're trying to manage. And a lot of languages just don't let you manage it, but C++ is a language that always gives you the power to manage whatever you want. So um, executors are trying to manage who who can allocate the CPU resource, and you know allocators are trying to manage who can allocate the memory. Yeah. I don't so, know so if there's Tony, any thought so, Tony, there, but you, you should write a paper for uh, that that proposing that executors be a language feature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll write it please, in April. But please, please, anybody listening, do not write such a paper. <laughs> I, I'm also I'm also merging contracts and 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 concepts because those are the same thing. One is one is compile time constraints and the other is runtime constraints. I'm not writing that paper either. I don't write papers. I write process papers, right? Rarely. Um. I, I'm, I, I had a list of things. I think we've covered them. Um, anyone else remember something that we, we skipped over that we should? Uh... We should probably ask these people in chat if they have any questions for us. Yeah. I do. I did have a thought there on variant, by the way, of um, we, a, a language based variant has the same, doesn't get us out of the problem of. Um, yeah, you really the, need pattern matching. Well, you don't, you get, don't get out of the problem of the value list. Uh, by exception case but, thing. But I don't, I don't think that's even like the main problem. I think the main problem is just like, have you used variant? It's yeah, I know. Not... Pattern matching is, is the big problem. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty nice if you write your own thing on top of visit that just takes a like list of, not a list, but like yeah, yeah, a, yeah. an argument list of mm. uh, lambdas and then just yeah, tries yeah. them in turn. The, like that's the, yeah. fine. The standard I, I, overload. I was the original, class. yeah, that, that little trick. I originally popularized, popularized that in my CPPCon talk in 2016 or so. I appreciate it. It's a really good trick. Mm. But like or pattern if, matching is like the way forward, I think. Yeah. There is a proposal for a thing called std overload, which was be like partially a language thing that would, uh, that would like be a way for you to capture an overload set. And uh, yeah, I'd like to see that, but that proposal is one of the many things lost to the annals of time. I did have one more question on the sense of what should we take out of this the thing? Um, I may as well go all in and ask what proposal currently in process should we kill? I can't answer this question. <laughs> I know you can't. I can't answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, other people could answer this question. Yeah. Uh, you can type privately to me, Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell anyone. It's okay. I think I've heard some complaining about executors mm, or yeah. like async code generally and how there really isn't an implementation that uh, exists. There's a lot to say about executors. Um, we we need them. We need we need to solve the executor problem. I like I said before, I can't keep up with the proposal. Definitely a lot of smart people working on it. Um, I don't know if it's the right proposal or not, but it definitely we, feels we like we don't like this is so what Rust has done with executors is okay, Puya has a very adorable child in their uh, image. <laughs> um, so the thing that Russ did was they standardized like async 
oh wait um and like all of like the language features that you need and then they said okay library authors figure it out like figure out what's good um as opposed to putting anything in the standard library until everything was actually figured out by the community before putting it in like a thing that needs to be stable forever and ever and ever and ever and we can't break for the next 30 years and, and it's funny though because we've had the opportunity i mean we, we don't know you're right we don't quite have the language facilities but you know we always can do the, the language is built such that you can do almost anything anyhow um even if it's ugly like that's what boost always showed it's like you know you don't have lambdas but you have boost lambda um to push the language um like i've written executor like things and people have written them you'd think we've had enough experience but yeah it seems like maybe we we, we haven't no yeah, I, mean, I think the uh, same thing also happened with ranges where like all of the existing ranges implementations were implemented in c plus plus 11 and like awful because they were implemented in c plus plus 11. what i would have wanted to see was an implementation that actually was able to take advantage of concepts and like be a real implementation of ranges before standardizing although i think ranges is probably a lot better than than uh than executors because we do have a lot more experience um I mean, I, I think we've got sufficient experience with um, with this with senders receivers now. Um, uh, I think order of magnitude comparable to what we had when we standardized ranges. Um, I, I, I'm not. I'll say this: um, the C plus plus committee needs to decide the fate of the networking TS, and we're going to do it by the end of this year. Um, either it is our longest lived TS, it has been around since 2018, either we're going to ship it or we're going to stop trying to ship it because we're not going to get any new information. Like if there, there is no reason to not ship the networking TS in C++23 unless we are fundamentally unhappy with the design. It, it has all the maturity that it's going to have, it's based on ASIA, which has been in the field forever. And so like, we're not gonna learn anything new. So we need to make a decision about whether or not we want this shape of networking or not. And if the answer is that we don't, then we need to look at a very different shape of networking. Um, because I think if we're not shipping it in 23, we're essentially talking about a redesign. Jeff had a good paper uh, safe by default on the networking. I don't know whatever happened to that one, but. Oh, oh yeah. And the, the, there's the whole separate security question around the networking TS, which uh, hasn't, it has not come up yet in real force in this round of design discussions, um, uh, but um, is almost certainly going to um, come up at some point and really needs to be addressed. Um, there a, is a topic I forgot, and I meant to come back to it, um, ABI. I, I, I think the ABI problem is part of why um, standardization goes so slowly, right? We, we, we're currently in a state of we can't afford to make a mistake, even though we make mistakes all the time. But part of the reason proposals go through a gauntlet to get somewhere is because we're afraid of writing things in stone. So what are we gonna what are we gonna do about this ABI problem? I know what the I mean, answer is, but I'll I ask mean, the question. We need, we either need a language we need language facilities to make it easier for us to write ABI resilient facilities, and the other thing is that you know when we standardize big features, we might need to signal to implementations in some way that we expect that this feature may need to evolve in the future. And so build your implementation in a way that is going to be ABI stable or ABI resilient rather. Um, I, I would also say, okay, I'm actually going to disagree with everyone who has ever had an opinion on ABI, which is ABI is good. Uh, not breaking ABI is good. Don't design your standard library in, an, in a way that you would need to break ABI. Is that possible? Yes, yeah. use your package manager. 
like the standard library should offer types that are obvious and easy to implement. What about standard string? I think standard string should do a whole lot less than what it currently does. No, that but is true. Standard string is ABI stable at this point. It is now, but it wasn't. And people <laughs> probably thought it was, and now we realize it wasn't. Yes, um, th this is like, stop being clever in your standard string implementations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think if we had string view like 20 years ago, we could have been less clever in stood string and it would have been fine. Yeah. Like, that's Rust point. doesn't have this problem because they standardize borrowed stir from the beginning. I but mean, like, Rust, Rust is trying to figure out how to do mutex, you know, and they're worried about ABI there, right? I doubt I'm, it. I'm so um, limited on my Rust knowledge. Uh, I doubt even... it because Rust doesn't have the ABI problem because they rebuild the world every time. Um, but like the point is, the C++ standard library being ABI stable is fine if you can depend on third-party libraries that don't need to be ABI stable. Yeah, um, although, although there, like I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna beat up on MSVC a little bit here. Like MSVC std mutex for anybody who doesn't know, std mutex is like two x slower and eight times larger than std shared mutex because std mutex needs to be compatible back to Windows XP. And um, I don't think that that's in, that's not because of any breaking change that was made in um, uh, in the C++ standard. It's just because of their implementation strategy. And I think that's a good example of a place where um, I, at the time that they, the MSVC first shipped stood mutex, they weren't thinking about the need to evolve it. Um, and I think that if that had been a concern, it could have been designed in a different way um, that would have been more API resilient. Yeah. It's possible that, that, um, that we've just gotten better at this than we were in the past. Yeah, for standard mutex, you could actually even put in a, they could have put a ver version number or something on the front of it because you think, oh, well, that's a waste, but just standard mutex, you're already taking time and space. Like that wouldn't have been a, a big yeah. issue. Well, yeah, you need to, it, what should have been done is that they allocated it. Um, yeah. Right, like for stuff like that, which is likely to change over time, probably the best thing to do is just put it behind a pointer. Yeah. I do think that... Um, um, also what uh, Boisano said, allocated <laughs> mutex is relocatable, which... Yeah. Isn't that what yeah. Rust does? Because like they need everything to be relocatable, right? They're mm -hmm. changing how they do it, though. They're changing how they do... They're trying to change how they do mutex. There's a good talk on it out there. It's the only talk oh. I've ever watched on Rust, but it's really good. Um, they, the, the mutex will become one byte if they use the new way of doing it. Um, uh, you mentioned that if we design things right, um, I think unordered map was designed wrong, right? In that it was too, it was overspecified, right? Okay. We, we, we talked about buckets. We talked about, it was like, we should not have, like no one cares about that stuff. I know that as C++ programmers, we want to have all control over everything, but um, unordered map should have just been like very open-ended how you implement it under the, under the covers. And then we could maybe have a better hash and a better, you know, whether it's open addressing or whatever, you know, like that should have been uh, available. And I worry about um, whatever it's called now, uh, flat map. Wow. There, was a, there was a time there where it looked like it was going to be specified to, to there was too much implementation leaking out of the spec, spec. We, were, we were talking about whether the key and the data live together or side by side in a, in parallel, you know, it's like structive arrays or arrays, arrays of structs. And it's like, we should not expose that in any way such that it gives implementation freedom. And if we design our things a little less strictly, um, that gives more leeway. That's my concern with some other recent container proposals that yeah. they, over, they specify too much. Uh, I have no idea which one you're talking about, but uh, standard colony, standard hive, I've brought that up 
on that one, um, which hopefully helped. Um, in in the fact that it felt it also felt to be like some things are being over specified, and it's like don't specify this. Like you know, sure, specify complexity things that that's important to C plus plus developers, but it is an easy mistake to make because you think we're putting this into the standard. We have to be very precise, but. <laughs> As I said in the C++ now talk, the standards really more like um, guidelines than rules. Um, you know, implementation freedom is really important. You want to specify enough, um, but you want to leave room for implementation freedom and for 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 evolution. And so you don't want to describe exactly how it's implemented. You want to describe only as much as you need to and nothing more. So Poissonneau has bail. had his hand up for a while. What, yeah. What's it's, up? I, I'm going to have to bail. I'm sorry, everyone. It's 25 to 1 in the morning here. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah. Lord. Yeah, you should, probably, you should probably go to sleep. I'm in London. Cheer, everyone. Stay oh, all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So we mentioned strings earlier. Uh, one type that I've been wondering about for years. It's the one that every other language has as the built-in type. It's a shared immutable string. Why don't we have it? Oh, what? Shared I, immutable strings. Oh, uh, like a rope? No. Oh, is that what rope was? I thought it was- No, the rope, a rope is strings. a linked list of strings. Yeah. Uh, okay. Shared- <laughs> Shared immutable string. Okay. It's not actually, but like think of it like that. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. I um, mean, it, it can be cow too, just as long as it's thread safe. No, like o OCaml's string, for example, is a pointer to a constant array. And uh, that's all it is. Like you don't have pushback, you don't have popback, you don't have any mutators. You just have this, this like allocated boring type. And I think the answer to that is that uh, languages that are at the level of C++ do not need a type like this. Like languages with ownership do not need a type like this. Well, no, there, there's advantages. Rust does not to, have this type. There's advantages to an immutable string type. Um, I'm sure. It does. Sorry, it doesn't need it in the standard library. If you want it, just write it. Just yeah. write it. Yeah. Right. Like Rust has box stir, which is basically the same thing. But like, isn't there an argument that the standard library already has one? Uh, like uh, in the exception types, it has to have a string in it, a message. But also, when you copy the exception, it can't throw. So clearly, the copy cannot allocate memory. So it has to share it in some way so isn't is yeah. it already in the standard library in some way no because like like th that is one way that you might implement exception messages there are other strategies that would work and that's just really a detail of how exceptions work it's not necessarily implemented in that fashion okay yeah, the, the real and, question and it's a very it's a very easy thing to write like it's a shared putter car array const car array sure yeah. if, if shared pointer like had a great array interface that like you could just use that yeah there are things that are missing because i i've i've used one i i wrote one before um and um it's actually something that it could help with language support because when in its constructor of a immutable string, um, I don't know whether the the you know char star that you passed um, is literal or not. Right. right. You you need uh, uh, what's the name the user defined literal. That's the only way you can guarantee. That. Yeah, we have yeah. that now. But you know, when I when I wrote mine, I I didn't have that. Um, there's a way to do it with a macro, and you put um, the double hash in your macro to force. The macro will fail if you're not passing a char star uh, or string literal. Um, but uh, that that is a helpful thing, and and they're really useful for um, you know things like you can use the pointer as your as your map. You know you don't have to do 
uh, the string less than if you're if you're looking for uh, a, I mean, oh, maybe not a map because you care about the order in your map, but no one actually cares about order in map. <laughs> um, but if you just have a map, you just want to find this string, I guess an un unordered map or something like that, you can just use the pointer because um, it. Yeah, I think my, my you, argument is not necessarily that it's a bad type. It's just that it yeah. Yeah, you can write your own. In a standard library. It's a really trivial type to write. Yeah. Well, does, does it does it uh, pass uh, Bryce's litmus tests of you know? Um, no, it's not. Don't it's not used it's, that much, right? That, I don't that's, think it. I don't think it's commonly used enough to be considered part of the vocabulary. Yeah. But I, I I've personally implemented it all the time, and yeah, uh, Steve has a really good point in the comments, which is. It's not really used in an interface. Like you're using but it in the implementation of something. Vocabulary does not necessarily mean um, interface. Um, if something's commonly, commonly used, but it's not, uh, it doesn't appear in interfaces, it should still be in the standard library just so that it's part of the common lexicon, like memcopy or stidcopy. You're never gonna see that in, um, uh, in an interface, but it should still be in the standard library because there should just be one way to spell that so that when you look at somebody's code and you see that, you know what it does. But yeah, the bar is higher for things that don't actually appear in the traces. Yeah. Who else has questions? Come on, don't be shy. We're friendly. No, we've, we've exhausted them. Who, who, exhausted has, them. who has complaints is, uh, is the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who has complaints or grievances or feature requests? I'll, I'll answer all the feature requests right now. No. I just want a web view. Bryce, give me a <laughs> web view, please. I, I, I did actually kind of like web view. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, but it's not possible to implement. Yeah, Steve, what's up? Okay, so when does the gate open for twenty six? Um, well, it'll actually probably be. We'll, we'll start working on on twenty six. Um, probably probably in January. The 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 gate is already open in in some sense. Yeah. Right. Or let, let, let me pitch this, but yeah, it's, it's open in this sense. If you write a C++ committee proposal right now, which you should not do because you should not propose new features, you should instead write a paper that gives feedback in somebody else's paper. But if you were to do this thing, um, it, we would, you know, we wouldn't look at it until January or February, and then we'd be looking at it for the 26 cycle. Yeah. yeah I'll... All my papers right now are, are several that I'm trying to get across the goal line, but. Yeah, well, but, but your paper, your papers might, I mean, depending on what the paper is, they might have a shot of making it into the C++ 23 window. You just got to send me an email and. Yeah, well, you know. no, nothing for, nothing right now for library. It's like, but more stuff trying to, we want to get in named Unicode escape sequences. Oh, it's, it's for language feature, you mean? Yep. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that... Uh, I'm on this. I'm I've not, got I'm a schedule not, slot already. <laughs> I'm not saying that JF's job is easier. All I'm saying is that there's like one or there's like two evolution chairs and they like, you know, they don't have a backlog and there's like eight library evolution chairs and we're putting out fires everywhere. So you you uh, you dropped out you dropped out for a second there bryce i'm pretty sure you said jf's job is easier that's what i heard <laughs> exactly what i heard yeah jf's job is easier jf had open slots between now and january yeah bryce yeah. does not yeah my schedule is booked until like march uh, i i'm tempted to try to decide whether EWG has a worse uh, has a harder audience to manage than than you have, Bryce. But I probably shouldn't ask that question either. I think um, I think I think Library Evolution has greater unity um, 
and focus, but we also have a substantially larger amount of stuff to do and, and look at and review. I think there is substantially more debate and, uh, uh, you know, when you're designing a language feature, there's, there's also like oftentimes a lot more space for the design, um, you know, because you're, you're, you're building a new language component. Like, you know, you can do all sorts of things that just aren't, aren't options in uh, 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 library design. Um, I, I think we in Library Evolution, we have a, you know, the, the regulars have a better idea of what, um, what we're looking for. Um, there is often debate about, um, you know, which things, should, what should our priorities be, you know, whether a certain thing belongs in the standard library or not. But once we decide that we do want to standardize a thing, um, uh, we're all, all often pretty good at, um, uh, you know, figuring it out. It's just that, you know, that takes time. There's been a request to explain our TLAs, which is uh, three letter abbreviations. Uh, see, uh, see I, I, I just, I simply want to abolish them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's on our list here. So I'll, I will say EWG is Evolution Working Group. They design new features in the language. LEWG is Library Evolution Working Group. They design new features in the library. Um, there's other, yeah groups beyond that but i don't think we mentioned but i would them. like to abolish all of that and this is this is part of what i was talking about earlier about um participation in the committee being arcane and yeah. draconian um that you have to learn all these arbitrary numbers and whatnot like in my book there's library evolution and there's language evolution and like they, they don't need to be acronyms they they don't need to be working groups or like have a bunch of extra letters that's just all they are and there's no there's no such thing as SG sixteen. That's just a meaningless sequence of letters and numbers. But we do have a text in Unicode group. Thank God it's sixteen because it's kind of remind like UTF sixteen. It's the only way I remember what group that is. <laughs> Otherwise, I would not know it. And I know SG one because it's SG one. But yeah, that's going to be how I remember that from now on. I hope you know that. That's, I don't know it. I literally don't know any of the other ones. And I will mention. There's still a discussion in the in the email threads right now, um, with uh, some. The, it says, you know, let's talk about P one two three four, and I'm like, please tell me what paper that is in the in the title of the email, like in the subject line. Uh, so people, I, I see that there's some appreciation yeah. for SG one, the TV show, which of course was shot in Canada, and and so I will tell the story of that. SG1 stands for study group one, which is the concurrency study group. And uh, yes, we do have t-shirts that have the Stargate on it. Um, and that says SG1 uh, concurrency. Yeah, yeah that, that, that is a study group that is totally bought into their, their label. So that one's okay. You know, we, we've learned that one. Yeah, but, well, and also there's the t-shirt. So it's pretty, pretty easy to, uh, you yeah. know. Oh, even this, like, you know, uh, Olivier will walk up there and do a, you know, the formal group presentation at the end of the week. And he's got like a logo with SG1 logo and, and yes. it's, it's everywhere. It's, yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. Did we uh, solve all the problems we tried to solve here today? So, oh yeah, WG21.link is pretty cool. It's the best part of our infrastructure. But and I will note, I will I, note, WG21.link, the best part of C++'s infrastructure is maintained by somebody whose like primary job is working on Rust. It's written in Rust. The WG21.link, I think, is written in Rust. Yes, I'm pretty certain that, that at least also, part of it is. Also, ELIS slash C++ draft is, yes. I think, the best thing ever. Yeah. Um, it is also the only way that standard library implementers uh, implement the standard library, yeah. to be clear. Although you didn't uh, you didn't hear about it from us because it's not it doesn't officially exist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There is no GitHub and there is no ELIS slash C++ raft. Um, there will be no parallelism TS oh, version the, two. 
There is there is a GitHub. Oh wait, no, maybe we are publishing. No, no, no. There, there, yeah, there, there, there is a GitHub. Get, yes, there you is just a GitHub. you yeah. It's like you just have to be a technician. Yeah. Um, so uh, I I wrote a section in the live the last library evolution report about um, why grab bag TSs are bad. I don't want to ever do another library fundamentals TS, parallelism TS, or concurrency TS because they you end up focused. just being a collection for things that are, you know, that we that we didn't want to say no to. So I'm okay with us shipping TSs, but only if they are focused and if they have a purpose. Um, like it's possible that it it's very likely that we'll do a senders receivers TS if senders receivers doesn't make it into C plus plus twenty three. Um, but that will have a very focused and, and uh, specific uh, uh, role. There, there are, so the stated purpose of a TS is to answer questions, um, design questions. We used to think that TSs would get us field experience, which means implementation experience, usage experience, and deployment experience. We've since learned that we don't actually really get much usage or um, deployment experience with TSs. We do sometimes get some implementation experience, but implementations don't often implement them. The other benefit to a TS is um, it's an arbitrary deadline, and arbitrary deadlines are actually incredibly useful. So if we've got a feature that's been kicking around for a long time, um, sending it out to a TS can be a good way of us saying, um, you know, we think that this is like refined enough that we want to like send it through the next stage of review um, uh, and like get it published and give us a chance to get some feedback on it before we fully, you know, commit to it. So they're like they're like beta branches, or like they're pull requests on it, the standard. It's I don't know if it was just because of the timing or whatever, but it seemed like the TR one TR two got more usage experience than. Well, than yeah, because T there, because there was a huge gap, gap. And, yeah. and and also implementers didn't have anything else to do. Right. Like right now, implementers are a little bit busy implementing C plus plus twenty. They're not going to have time to go and implement any TSs. The Isn't file system my... TS did seem to get implementations. Yes, but that, but that did not help student file system very much now, did it? Okay. Can I get an official statement from you, Bryce, that we're not going to do a, a two-style API ever again, please? That we do like the exception version and the non-exception version? Just don't let that happen. I don't, I actually love that. Oh, I actually God. very much love that design. I'm you are no, no, you have lost your position as as chair. I've just taken it away from you. I don't I, as the ask Wait, Illuminati. The with that? It's a terrible yeah. thing to show people. I, I think I think it's like, I think it's one. great. Well, like I'll tell you why I think it's great. Um because um I don't want, like even stood expected, I don't love because it, it still gives you a way to drop the error. Um, and the great thing about the split error handling API and some extended file system is for the people who don't want exceptions and who are like very anti-exception, they have a way of getting out an error code um, uh, and like handling it, you know, manually, which they like for whatever reason. And for everybody else who like has stuff to do, they can just use the version that's going to throw exceptions and then get their errors reported and not have them be dropped on the floor. So it makes everybody happy. Yeah, the way that VC package does this is we have you either can pass an error code, you can pass an ignore error. Uh, if th there are times where you want to ignore errors and you want to explicitly say that you're ignoring the error, and then you can also uh, pass a line info and then we just crash and print out error info. like. And that Love works it. perfectly. Do that. Yep. That is should be the standard for error handling. Yeah, I love it. We're we're, we're just going to end up with like every API is going to be written this way. It's it's a default. It's a bad precedent. It's a defaulted parameter. It's a bad precedent. Yeah, well, you, you you can you can spar me over it the next time it comes up in the library yep. evolution. Yep. But no, the bigger problem with std file system is that it has that whole security vulnerability that's like large enough that you can fly a star destroyer through. Is it a talk cow thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course it is.
I don't know. I think, yes, Talk Tao is bad, but like, <laughs> it's better to have std file system in the library because people are going to write Talk Tows anyways. <laughs> right. No, I, I, I'll agree with that. I'll agree with that. The also, answer, for the people answer who is don't to... understand what I'm saying, a Talk Tow is time of check, time of use, vulnerability. Basically, you have like two function calls, like check if my user has access to this file and then open that file. And in between these two things, you can like, somebody else can do something and uh, like make it so you no longer have access. And so you're still using it, even though your user does not have uh, access to it. Um, yeah. This is like why Windows requires uh, Administrator access in order to put uh, uh, in order to put oh my gosh uh, sim links on the system is for this exact like talk tau thing. Yeah, the the I, I see it in our code. No, no, I mean this isn't this a security problem, but just the general problem of people go if the file exists, then open the file, and I constantly just remove the if the file exists check because you'll find out when you try to open it. Like, yeah, there's, there's no <laughs> this reason is why to... you open with an error code, like, yeah. Yeah. and then you get like file does not exist. And you're like, oh, good. Uh, TOC. Yeah, I put it in there. Oh, but, yeah. Let me check time of use. But also, Steve, isn't, to be isn't clear, a... not just multi-threaded, any system that has multiple processes will have this problem, especially because exists doesn't even have to is have like. That doesn't even have to have multiple processes, just interrupts. Yeah, just interrupts. Yeah, no, 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 because because yeah, that that's the idea. It's like if your system is not literally a boot sector uh, program, that you it, don't have yeah. control. Like I, I, I think Steve's point is that it is the same. It's the same general problem, right? Anything where you check is you know is is yeah. the is does the queue have an item in it? Okay, pop from the queue anything like that where there's a gap in time that things could change behind your back they're but, all bad yeah, yeah but but generally speaking and like we, we've deleted some of the we deleted i think use count from shared pointer or something but like yeah they're not very useful because like like if you know that they're not going to give you a reliable answer then what are you expecting to do with them probably only debugging statements but the far more likely case is that you're just not going to, you're just going to assume that they're going to give you a reliable answer. So the, yeah, the, the, what's going to happen nine times out of 10 is you're going to misuse the API. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. the best part is you will never find it in testing, um, yeah. you know, because it just doesn't, you know, you didn't catch that one little moment where it happened. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say that my biggest problem with file system is because I sit and text Unicode a lot. And everyone comes to us and says, we want file paths to be text. And we basically have to say, no, they aren't. Pretending that they are is just going to hurt you. File systems don't actually think they are. The only thing you can hand a file system is what it gave to you. Stop trying. Yeah. You may want to print them out. Don't assume you can do anything with that thing you printed out. Even though all programmers do this, you cut and paste from whatever to whatever. Yeah, it's like that doesn't actually work. I, I have a good answer for that is that I don't care if my user of my program tries to use a file system thing that I can't print or can't, you know, that's not text. But that's because my app is not, you know, I'm not trying to write a file system or, or a low level system or any, you know, the things that C++ uh, allows you to do so yeah it we c++ cannot make that assumption that it's text because it's not but yeah. you know what I, in my app i can i just i don't care for that user who <laughs> gave me a file that wasn't text i was just like sorry oh you you can move the data from through your car star null terminated string that works yeah yeah, yeah that too just kind of Sometimes on Dude. Unix systems. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so you can move it through your W car T yeah. on other systems. The fact but that <laughs> car star is implicitly convertible to path 
or string is implicitly convertible to path was, a, in my opinion, a massive mistake. Because on Windows, it is never what you want, really. Um, like, and like in VC package, until we wrote our own path because reason, we had to basically sprinkle FSU8 path like all of the places, which was just really not great. And then they broke FSU8 path uh, in C++20, which was so good. Didn't break all our code at all. Sorry. Okay. So, people are still here. What What do you guys want to talk about? I don't know. Bryce, to can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me, Bryce? Connor. Hi, Connor. How you doing, buddy? I'm trying. To, I was trying to speak up earlier, but because uh, my camp there. Yeah. Uh, you need to. We talked about this. You've cut out. You You You're You're cutting out. Do you know how to use these things? Okay, so so what there happens is this Ubuntu <laughs> distro silences my, my Connor, Connor, every Connor, five seconds. Connor. So I just have to keep on. <laughs> Connor, I just have to keep Linux, on. <laughs> can you hear me now? Connor, Linux is cool, <laughs> but if you want to do real stuff, go get a Windows computer. <laughs> it's Ada. That's all I want to say. Not Ada. Named yeah. after Ada Lovelace. I'm aware, but you're also aware that I uh, I mispronounced things. Not okay. She's a hero. I blame right, Charlie you. for my pronunciation of Ada. Yeah. You can fix it now. You can you can change your ways now. It's, yeah. Well, you, there's uh, still time. <laughs> Listen and, to the Canadians. And Connor, of course, is uh, my co-host of the ADSP podcast, which I forgot to plug during my intro. Yeah, he always does. He always the, does. Uh, the first half Canadian C++ podcast, I believe. Do you want to be on? Do you want to be on the C++ meetup? My sister's making spaghetti. You don't want to? Oh wait, which well, sister? I can just I can just turn wait, the. Wait, wait, which sister? Have I met this sister? Come say hi. Uh, she's visiting from Calgary. She's an engineer. Hi. That's Hello. Nice. Which of the, which of your sisters is this? This is my oldest one. She's the engineer. Oh okay okay. Shannon. You're yes. famous now to 37 people. Hi, Shannon. Well, this will go around the whole internet. Thank you. Oh, apparently this is recorded and we're posting it online. <laughs> okay, I'll look, I'll look for my debut. <laughs> Anyways, that's all I wanted hey, to say, Bryce. Now, now, I've, now I've met 50% of your sisters. And now you wow. Doesn't even remember that I have three sisters. That's 30. <laughs> oh, so wait, no, I thought you had four sisters. Oh, no, wait. Yeah, you met Kieran in Ireland. So, yeah, you've met 67%. Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, I got to go now because people are coming over. But uh, thank you, Tony, for hosting. I appreciate all the puns. And uh... yeah, have fun. Get, tell, tell your sister to go buy you some <laughs> artwork and put it up on your walls because it's just depressing <laughs> and white everywhere there. <laughs> it's, the, it's the bachelor life, okay? I, I'm going to come up and decorate. No, you can come up, but actually, I'll, I'll let you hang something up on my wall if you come to the place. All right. Later, Anyways, buddy. Have a good night, I'll see you on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's time to say standard C out, but we can, you know, official wrap up, but we can uh, keep talking unofficially yeah. if people right. want to. See y'all. I need to go to Seattle uh, to get an ice cream maker. So bye. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I, I'm just gonna go get ice cream. Thanks. <laughs> thanks to the bye. panel again, and thanks to our moderator, Tony. It was terrific. And we will post it online, all of it, except for the part where Tony said he was good at Unicode. And uh, hope to see you all again. Thanks. And uh, feel free to hang on if you want to stay in chat. Nicole, right. you don't need an, you don't need an ice cream maker if you live in New York. You can just it's just everywhere. They don't have ice cream in, on the West Coast? Not as good. You want to talk about bagels Not on again? Your block, but you although, can block. although, annoying.